So the main goal of this course has been to describe the modern foundations of mathematics. And I'm really going to try and deliver on that goal today because I'm going to describe dependent type theory from a formal perspective. I'm going to explain the proper rules by which we can really do dependent type theory in a properly rigorous way, in a way which we could even implement within a computer. And I'm also going to go over a kind of outline of the ideas of homotopy type theory. So in particular, after we've gone through the rules of dependent type theory, we'll be in a position where there's just a couple of sort of axioms that we need to absorb. And then we can really understand um, how homotopy type theory is set up, giving a flavor of homotopy type theory. And hopefully kind of describing the axioms of it so that you can really understand exactly what the theory is. Another thing I've decided to put on the end of this video is a very short description of the programming language Idris. So I do a couple of demonstrations with that language and then briefly discuss how it can be used to encode category theory. Okay, so one of our main goals is to understand the modern foundations of mathematics in a formal way. And so what we really want to do is to look at how this very powerful kind of dependent type theory is set up in a formal way, because we want to understand this theory right the way down to the bottom. And we want to understand it so well that we can implement it in a computer. And this is a really great thing to do for many reasons. I think the main good reason for wanting to understand this is so that we really understand what our kind of mathematics means. When we can build our mathematics on this sort of formal system and we can understand the rules of it all the way down to the bottom, that is going to really help to make our mathematical thinking more clear. And another great reason to do this is that there are many fascinating computer programming languages like Idris and COQ and Agda and Lean Theorem Prover, which are sort of based on these dependent type theories. And to be honest, um, when one looks at programs like that um, without knowing about dependent type theory, they seem absolutely mystical. It seems like the people who um, created those kind of languages like have an IQ over 5,000 or something. But um, when you actually know about the dependent type theory uh, and know how to implement it formally, you start to see sort of how those people acquired that knowledge and how one might create a new kind of computer programming language. I actually find this idea quite kind of funny. I mean, personally speaking, I was learning about this sort of dependent type theory purely for kind of academic interest. And then suddenly it was like, oh, I know how to make a computer programming language now. The, the sort of um, knowledge to do that is, is a sort of, um, for me, it was a sort of unexpected byproduct of um, pursuing these goals of formalizing mathematics. And um, it's remarkable, I, I often think, how many sorts of um, other very useful skills one acquires um, in the pursuit of understanding of pure mathematics. Anyway, um, right, so let's get down to business then. We want to describe this dependent type theory properly. So I have a previous video where I tried to go through the ideas of dependent type theory in an informal way. Uh, it's up to you if you want to watch that video first. It might make this stuff easier to understand, but hopefully I can um, make all this uh, material at least relatively self-contained. Um, and so let's just go. So the idea, if, so the first idea we'll talk about is a context. And we can think of a context as defining some sort of an environment where we have access to different variables of different types. But I mean, really, 
Um, this dependent type theory is, in a sense, just a sort of symbol manipulation game. So we have a sort of uh, more um, concrete definition of a context. And it's really just a list um, of kind of type declarations. So basically a context is a list like this one shown here, where we have these variables, x1, x2, and so on. And these, and these variables have different types. So x1 will be a variable of type a1. x2 will be a variable of type a2. And xn is a variable of type am. Now, um, I should say here, um, and this is a bit of a difference between dependent type theory and the kind of simple type theory that I discussed earlier. And the difference is that we can sort of talk about our universe of types. Um, and so in a sense, in dependent type theory, we sort of blur the line between terms and types. I mean, um, when you're doing simple type theory, um, it's, I mean, when you're doing simple type theory, there's a big distinction, right? We have these kind of types that we normally write as capital letters. And um, then we might have values or terms of those types. Okay, so when we write something like T is of type capital V, if we were doing dependent type theory, we would know that V is a type and T is a term. And those would be sort of things on different levels. Um, but the kind of lines are a bit more blurred when we are talking about dependent type theory. And that's because we also have this idea of a sort of universe of types. And so um, when we write, for example, that A is a member of the universe of types, when we write this kind of thing, um, this is sort of a way of saying that A is a type, okay? Um, and we could include this kind of thing within a context, okay? So independent type theory, the contexts are not just these kind of lists of variables which are like simply terms, some of the things in our context might be types. And then we'd be recording that those things are members of universes of types. So what I'm basically trying to say here is that one of the differences with dependent type theory is that, for example, within these contexts, yes, we're going to have a list of variables of different types, but amongst these contexts, we might also be saying that we have things like um, capital A belonging to a type universe. And so in a sense, the contexts will involve variables of sort of ordinary types, but also kind of, in a sense, the context may involve declaring the presence of what we might call variable types or kind of generic types. And those would be kind of members of a type universe. So basically, we might have stuff like this within our context. Anyway, we'll see examples of this later. Um, one of the kind of things about doing something like dependent type theory formally is that we start by introducing these kind of um, maybe even a little bit cryptic looking sort of inference rules. Um, and so it requires a little bit of patience. Um, if you sort of stick with this material for five or 10 minutes, by the time we actually get to an example, um, if you sort of study that example, a lot of the ideas and the kind of meanings of these rules will fall into place. But it's sometimes kind of hard to understand the rules uh, in isolation. You sort of want to see how they work together so that you can understand the meaning of the different expressions involved. Okay, so the next thing is we have this idea of an empty context. Okay, um, so I said that a context is basically a list of um, sort of type declarations of variables. So for example, variable X1 is of type capital A1 and so on. 
And an example of a context is just a, a list like this, but a list which is empty. Okay, so that's one example of a context. And we often denote that um, by a dot or sometimes just by using empty space. Okay, so the next idea then is the idea of a judgment. And um, in a sense, you can think of type theory as a sort of game. Um, it's a sort of game where there are sort of rules um, about what kind of moves you're allowed to make. A little bit like chess, okay? You have a certain position and then there are certain sorts of rules that you're allowed to apply to change that position. Um, and we call those things inference rules. Um, and then the kind of um, state of the game at a given time um, is really what we can think of as a judgment or a, um, a simpler way to say it is that a judgment is the kind of thing that you'd write on a single line. So I'll just show you an example of what I'm talking about. This is a typical kind of um, thing that we'd see in type theory. Now I'm going to explain the rules behind this momentarily, but um, basically when we have this kind of horizontal line, but basically when we have a kind of horizontal line, what that means is that the kind of judgment above the line um, implies the judgment below the line. Okay, so the idea is that we have these sorts of judgments and then we can use them to imply other stuff. And so this is kind of like the state of the game changing as we make different moves or apply different rules. Okay, uh, this analogy is a little bit um, fuzzy, but um, basically what I'm trying to say is that the judgments are really the kind of main thing that you talk about in dependent type theory in the sense that you're always interested in things like how you can use certain judgments to infer other judgments. And this is what you describe with this kind of horizontal line notation, which basically has the meaning that um, if the stuff above the horizontal line is true, which basically has the meaning that if you can obtain the information above the horizontal line, then that means that the stuff below the horizontal line can also be obtained. So basically what I'm saying is that the kind of rules are encoded with this kind of horizontal line notation, which basically says that if the sort of judgments above the horizontal line hold true, then the judgments below the horizontal line holds true. And so we can repeatedly apply rules um, to show that some kind of starting um, assumptions infer some other kind of judgment at the end. So, okay, there are basically three different kinds of judgments, okay? So this first one we write as gamma CTX. So firstly, gamma is notation that we often use to denote a context, okay? So something like what I've written here with the X's and the A's, we often might just abbreviate this kind of thing as gamma. And generally, when we see gamma, we mean that it represents uh, a kind of context, okay? Um, and sometimes we, we might also write delta to denote a context. But anyway, um, here we're saying more than this because we're not just writing a gamma, we're writing gamma space CTX. So what does this mean? Well, this is a judgment that this um, thing gamma here is what we call a well-formed context. Now, what's a well-formed context? Well, in a sense, um, the meaning of this and most of the other stuff that we're going to talk about is kind of implicit, okay? Um, what this really means is kind of um, inferred by the way that all these rules interact. Well, basically, when we say a context is well-formed, we are saying that um, the kind of stuff involved in that context um, is sort of naturally built up and well-defined as we read the context from left to right, okay? So it's a little bit like a well-written um, maths paper or something where um, everything that's discussed was defined previously, okay? Um, I mean, if you read Euclid or something, you can see that quite a lot of effort's gone into 
um, trying to um, define everything properly before it's discussed. Okay. Um, and so this is the basic idea. So, for example, if you think about some kind of a context like uh, X1 is of type A1, X2 is of type A2, and so on. Well, remember, this is dependent type theory. OK, so this type A2 here may depend on some variables. OK, um, but if it depends on a variable which we've never referred to before and suddenly this new variable just sort of enters the con just sort of enters the expression here. Well, then, like, we won't know what that means. We won't even know what that variable is. And um, but and so that would stop our context being well formed because suddenly we're having like new ideas which are based on notation that we haven't even um, sort of explained the meaning of. Um, and so that would stop our context being well formed. However, um, if this A2 depends on X1, for example, that's fine because we've already sort of defined what X1 is earlier on in the context. So you don't really need to worry about understanding what this idea of a well-formed context means yet, because the meaning is sort of implicit uh, from the kind of rules that we're going to explain. Nevertheless, this really is the meaning, is that um, sort of as you read the context from the left to the right, um, the sort of way that all the bits and pieces are defined is using information which was previously defined. So this is our first kind of judgment, is to say that gamma is a well-formed context. And so this is a difference um, between dependent type theory and simple type theory. And the difference is that in addition to sort of keeping track of these kind of, um, this context entails, this um, type declaration or whatever, that kind of stuff, in addition to that kind of stuff, um, we also sort of keep track of how our contexts are formed and how our types are formed. And so there's sort of more information that we keep track of. And I actually think that's nicer because it, it means that more of the theory is encoded um, with these formal inference rules. But we'll see all this later. Um, so the next thing, our next judgment is this one. And that's to say that this context gamma entails that little a is of type capital A. And basically all this means is that if we have this context gamma, which might be this kind of thing here, for example, um, given that context, we can say that this term little a has type capital A. All right. So that's fine. This is really the kind of... Um, normal thing we see in type theory okay we have a load of stuff that we're assuming and given that stuff we can say that we have this term of a particular type and then the third and final kind of judgment that we have is this kind of we could call it a definitional equality judgment okay um so in dependent type theory um in the kind of dependent type theory we're discussing, um, there are sort of two different kinds of equality. Okay, there's what we might call definitional equality, where things are equal by definition. In other words, when we sort of define things as equal um, or where they're sort of equal as a consequence of really trivial things in the theory. Um, and that's kind of what we call definitional equality. And that's denoted by this triple bar. And then there's also another kind of equality called propositional equality, which has to do with some other things called identity types. Now, that second thing is the kind of equality you have to prove. It's, it's a bit more complicated and we'll get into that later. But um, what this judgment is basically saying is that if we have this context gamma, then we have the, these two terms a and a dash, which both have type capital A, are definitionally equal. Or some people say this means that they're judgmentally equal. 
All right. So basically, you can just think that what this kind of judgment saying is that A and A dash are equal, sort of by definition. OK. Right. So that's the idea of judgments. The next thing is um, this kind of horizontal line notation, which is basically this kind of idea of judgment rules. OK. And this is the basic idea. So when we write this kind of thing, what we're really saying is that if we can show that these judgments uh, from J1 all the way up to JK hold true, then we can say that this judgment K holds true. So this is the ordinary kind of form of what we are. It's called an inference rule. So in a sense, there's really sort of two different kinds of inference rules. There's what I might call primitive inference rules, which are basically the kind of rules of the game. They're the sort of um, axioms, if you like. They're the sort of inferences that we make, um, which are sort of given to us by the theory. Um, so basically, the way that dependent type theory works is that there are certain sorts of inference rules that we're allowed to apply. And um, they're the sort of primitive ones. And then we can kind of chain those rules together to derive other sorts of inference rules. So here's an example. Um, here at every step, I'm applying one of the kind of primitive inference rules, but sort of chaining those together, I can sort of derive another kind of inference rule, which is basically that um, the judgment at the top, the kind of empty judgment, uh, infers the kind of judgment at the bottom. So this thing I'm writing in blue here, this is a sort of inference rule which I've derived. It's not um, really an axiom, it's more like a theorem, if you like. Um, so anyway, we'll be getting into the specific nature of some of these inference rules momentarily. So the basic idea then, so basically you can think of dependent type theory a bit like a game. And these kind of um, judgments are sort of like positions and these kind of primitive inference rules um, are sort of like the moves you're allowed to make. Now, um, there are some of these rules that might involve um, taking several judgments and then outputting a judgment. OK, um, so we'll see those later. Um, right. So I like to write these kind of primitive inference rules, these sort of axioms or rules of our game. I like to write them in red like this. So this is our first sort of rule for our theory. And it's called um, CTX EMP or um, the kind of empty context rule. And so all this rule is saying is that the empty context is a well-formed context. OK, so let me try and pass this a little bit. Um, above the line, we have nothing. So this basically means that from no assumptions, um, we have that this stuff at the bottom is true. So remember, this horizontal line notation means that if the stuff above the horizontal line is true, then the stuff below the horizontal line is true. So from no assumptions, we have that dot is a well-formed context. And here dot denotes the empty context. So this is basically just saying that we always have that the empty context is a well-formed context. OK, um, next we have this idea of type universes. So we write UI to denote the kind of ith level type universe. So basically, the idea is that um, independent type theory, um, these sort of types that we have, for example, the kind of things we would like to write with capital A, capital B and so on, um, we imagine that they belong to a type universe. Um, but then that type universe that we might write as uh, U, that itself is a type and as such, will belong to a kind of higher level type universe. So we have a kind of hierarchy of type universes. Um, and 
they're sort of cumulative. So uh, anything in the ith level type universe is also in the i plus one level type universe and so on. Um, and so we have that the zero level type universe is a member of the first level type universe is a member of the second type level type universe and so on. Um, so, okay, let's get on to our next kind of primitive inference rule then. Here it is. It's called the universe introduction rule. And what it says is that for any I, if we have that gamma is a well-formed context, then we have that gamma entails that the ith level universe is a member of the i plus one level universe. So basically what this is saying is that um, in any kind of situation, we can always say that ui is a member of ui plus one. Okay. Um, and if you're seeing these for the first time, they might look a bit weird. Hopefully momentarily when we kind of um, use these rules together, um, you'll see how things make sense more. Um, and so the next rule, the next kind of primitive rule is this so-called context extension rule. And basically this is encapsulating the idea that if we can cook up a type, then we can grab a variable from that type and attach it to our context. So um, a lot of the things that you see in, um, so a lot of the things that you see in dependent type theory sort of have the form of something like gamma entails little b is of type capital B, it's this, this kind of thing. This is what you see mostly in dependent type theory. So we often have these kind of contexts appearing on the left-hand side. Um, and it turns out to just be a sort of consequence of the way that the rules work, that um, when you have this kind of thing happen, such a context appearing on the left-hand side of this and of this turnstile here um, turns out to um, sort of be well formed. Okay, um, but still we like to. But still, that's a sort of implicit thing. I mean, um, we really like to um, actually, you know, use this kind of CTX notation, and um, you know, make sure that these things that we're forming are well-formed contexts. So anyway, here's our next kind of rule then, this context extension rule. And um, what it's really saying is that when we have this kind of situation, like here, we will have this kind of context involving, you know, some type declarations. So X1 is of type A1, all the way up to X n to the minus one is of type A n to the minus one. When we have that this kind of context, entails that a n is a member of this type universe u i then um, that infers that we can form this then that infers that we can get this well-formed context here now notice that this is basically what we get by grabbing the left hand side of this thing above the horizontal line and then clipping onto the end this variable xn of type an. So essentially what this rule is saying is that if um, this kind of context here um, entails that we have this kind of type an, then we can grab a variable of type an and attach it to the end of our context. And here um, xn should be distinct from any variable appearing previously in this context. Okay. Um, we don't like So yeah, um, now we'll see momentarily how this context extension rule works and hopefully it will become clearer then. And the final kind of um, rule I want to talk about in this kind of initial batch is this so-called VBLE rule. And we can think of this as um, basically giving us this idea of creating instances so um, what this rule says, so what this rule says is that if we have this well-formed context uh, above the line, which is like 
a list of uh, sort of type declarations. So X1 is of type A1 and so on. Um, then what we can do is we can form this kind of judgment here where we're basically saying that this context entails um, any particular type judgment within it. So here I, so here somewhere in this kind of context here um, is going to be this uh, type declaration XI is of type AI. And so that's going to be sort of buried somewhere within this list. And so we can say that um, in this context where all this stuff is true, um, then that gives us the XI is of type AI. So it's really quite a kind of simple idea in a sense. It's just this idea that if you know all this stuff, then you know any particular thing within this stuff. Um, so, okay, that's great. These are our, so, okay, that's great. These are our first few kind of rules. And this primitive rule here is called VBLE. Uh, I'm taking these rules and the kind of names for them and so on um, from the appendix A2 of the homotopy type theory book. It seemed to be the uh, clearest kind of um, exposition of the rules of dependent type theory that I've seen. Um, so, okay, let's now have a look at how these different rules can kind of work together. And so we're really going to try and, uh, and so we're really going to derive something which in a sense seems kind of obvious and that's basically this idea that from no assumptions, we have that if uh, capital B is a type, so in other words, if capital B is a member of our zero level type universe, and if X is a variable of type B, then that entails that X is a variable of type B. Um, so, you know, in a sense, this seems kind of obvious. And the fact that we actually have to do work to get at this some people might say, well, that's um, that's daft. Why are you having a theory where, um, you know, you have to actually um, do calculations to figure out things which are totally obvious? But I actually think quite the opposite. I think this is a wonderful thing about this dependent type theory because it kind of allows us to kind of um, scratch the back of our head. It, it allows us to kind of have access to and be able to think about these kind of so-called obvious assumptions um, under everyday reasoning. It allows us to be able to formalize everything and kind of, um, it allows us to be able to formalize everything and kind of see this kind of um, way that we can record um, all of the interesting kind of um, things in mathematics in this sort of um, formal notation. So then one can kind of bridge the gap between the kind of cold um, symbolic notation and um, kind of software um, and the kind of vibrant imagination and, you know, creative mathematics. And so I really love this, actually, that we can drill all the way down to the bottom. Anyway, um, Anyway, that said, let's simply have a look at how we can sort of derive this kind of rule here I've written in purple. So we start um, with nothing and then we can use our empty context rule to say that this empty context is a well-formed context. OK, so this is applying this CTX EMP rule here. Next, we want to apply our universe introduction rule. So let's have a look at that. Here it is. It's saying that if we have a well-formed context gamma, then we can get that gamma entails that UI is of type UI plus one. So we'll use this universe introduction rule when gamma is the empty context and I is zero. And so we get that um, this empty context entails that U naught is a member of U one. Uh, and now here's the kind of subtlest part of this because we now want to apply our kind of context extension rule. And basically the idea is that since we've shown that U0 is a type, or we've shown that U0 belongs to a universe, we can create a variable of type U0 and attach that to our empty context. 
So this is an application of this context extension idea. So we're applying this idea when all of this, so we're applying this idea when all of this initial stuff is not there because we have the sort of empty context and we're doing this basically when this kind of an that we're writing here is actually a, a u naught, and um, that that's part of u1. And then the kind of result of applying this is that we have um, this sort of well-formed context, which consists of this sort of empty context together with this new kind of variable of type an that we're gaining. And this is going to be a sort of new kind of variable of type u naught. Okay. And we're calling it B. And so this is basically the idea. Um, another way. So I'll say it. So this is basically the idea. Essentially, the way that we can think of this is because we've got u naught, um, which is within this universe, um, that means that u naught is a type. And that means that we can define a variable of that type and add it to our well-formed context and a variable of type u naught is itself a type but it's a sort of generic or variable type that we're sort of forming here so now we have this context which is saying that we have this variable b of type u naught essentially it's saying that we have this context involving this kind of variable type b now, the next thing we can do is apply this kind of VBLE rule, which is basically just saying that when we have a context, we can get that that context entails any kind of entry in that context. So we can now get that B is in the type universe, entails that B is in the type universe. And then what we can do is context extension again, because now on the kind of right hand side of the turnstile, We've got something within a type universe, and therefore we can create a variable of that type B um, using this kind of rule again. So we can then kind of extend our context by adding this variable X of type B. And then again, we can apply this. And then again, we can apply this VBLE rule. Um, to basically get that this context entails this kind of special case of X of type B. And that's basically the end of this kind of um, derivation of this kind of rule here. Um, so we've essentially derived this rule um, from, so we've essentially obtained this rule just by applying our kind of primitive inference rules. Now, um, I strongly recommend um, you kind of study this example and make sure it makes sense to you because this is really going to help to uh, understand how all these rules work. And to be honest, you know, um, it, you know, this is really the kind of essence of formal type theory is to be able to work with these kind of formal inference rules. And I think it's um, it's like a really uh, great way to train the mind to think you know, more formally, which is a useful ability. Okay, so the next thing I want to mention is some more of these kind of structural rules, which are useful for sort of general manipulations. So this one here is called weakening. And basically what it says is that um, if we have a context gamma and a context delta, well, when we write gamma comma delta, we really mean we're sort of concatenating or sticking together these two lists of membership declarations um, to form a sort of bigger context. And so the way that we can read this weakening rule is that if in this context gamma, we have that capital A is a type, or if you like, capital A is a member of this um, i type universe for some i, and if we also have the, when we take gamma together with this extra delta kind of context, so we're forming this bigger context, if those two together entail that little b is of type capital B, well then, if we take this context gamma 
and then we sort of introduce this um, variable little x of type capital A um, within this sort of context and then add delta on the end, um, then that also entails that little b is of type capital B. So um, basically what this is really saying is that if we have a situation where um, we have that something entails that little b is a member of type capital B, um, then we can basically add in a variable x of type A within the middle of this context, provided that the things that come before the kind of position where we want to add in that little x of type A into our context um, are sufficient to entail that um, the type that we want that little x to be of can be formed, okay? So this is the idea of weakening and um, loosely speaking, it basically just means that we can introduce variables into the left-hand side of our judgments. Okay, so another kind of structural idea is this idea of substitution. So we've already discussed this before um, when I was talking about a simple type theory. Um, and I think the idea is basically very similar in dependent type theory. Um, so, so basically, if we have a term little b, and we also have a term little a, and a variable little x, and a and x have the same type, then when we write this, b a slash x, what that means is it's the term we get if we take little b and then we replace every free occurrence of x with a. So, you know, sometimes variables can be bound and we have various different operations that can bind variables. But the idea of this substitution is that the sort of unbound or free occurrences of the variable but the idea of this sort of substitution is that all unbound or free occurrences of this variable x will be replaced with little a in this uh, term b. Okay. So, okay, now we get on to this idea of substitution. So the basic idea here is that we have a term b, a term little b. And we also have a term little a and a variable x. And we're supposing that a and x have the same type. And in this case, what we mean by this notation here, b of a slash x, is we mean the term that one obtains by taking the term b and then replacing every free occurrence of a little x with a little a. Okay, so it's basically, the idea is that this term b might have some occurrences of this variable x in it. And, um, you know, some of those could be free. Okay, so we have some kinds of um, operators that can bind variables in this dependent type theory, much as we had in a simple type theory. Um, and so some of the variables, little x, that occur in this term b may be bound, and we can't touch those. But the sort of unbound or free occurrences of the variable x in this term b, well, when we write this kind of notation, we mean that we can take all of those free occurrences of x and replace each of them with this term a. Okay, so in a sense, this ability to do substitutions kind of justifies the name variable, right? Because the idea of variables is that they can have varying kinds of interpretations or we can imagine what happens when we replace them with specific terms of the same type. Now, when we do such substitutions, um, now when we do such substitutions, we should probably check that A is free for X in B. And you can look at my video on simple type theory for more details. I'm just sort of trying to quickly overview the rules of dependent type theory at the moment.
So we have this idea of substitution. So what this is saying is that um, if our context gamma entails that little a is of type capital A, and also if a given gamma and given a variable little x of type A, together with um, some extra kind of contextual information delta. So, I mean, basically, once again, gamma and delta are both contexts, and this notation means kind of gluing together all of the information in these two contexts together with this typing, together with this type declaration. Well, um, if basically given the gamma and the x of type A and the delta, we have little b is of type capital B, then that infers that if we take gamma and we take delta with x replaced with A, then that entails that we have this term B with x replaced with A, and that's going to be of the type capital B with x replaced with A. So notice that when we have these kind of type declarations in dependent type theory, um, the kind of types to which things belong may themselves have variables, okay? Um, because the sort of types of things can depend on values. So that's why we think that capital B might depend on X here. And the basic idea here is that when we write this sort of notation, um, we're essentially sort of suggesting that the rest of this context delta, the stuff that comes after the X of type A, may depend on this variable X of type A. And also that this term little b and this type capital B may also depend on this X of type capital A. And the idea basically is that um, if up to here, so if we're just reading this context from left to right, if we just read as far as the gamma, well, if that entails that we have a variable little a of type capital A, well, then we're free to sort of take this, the rest of the stuff which occurs in this, and then replace all of the X's with A's. And that's going to give us another legitimate sort of expression. So an easy way to start to understand what this means is just to think about the case where this context delta is empty, because in that case, what this is basically saying is that um, if gamma can give us this term little a of type capital A and um, gamma and this variable x can give us this term little b, then if we have gamma, we can always take this term little b and replace the x with an a. Okay, and the type of that may change as well if the type of that little b also um, may sort of depend on this variable little x. So another thing that we have in our theory then is this idea of sort of judgmental equality, which we like to write with triple lines. Okay, and so we also have these kind of corresponding results to do with substitution and weakening, um, which relate those ideas to this idea of definitional equality. So we have this idea of definitional equality, which is sort of saying that things are equal in a simple kind of way. And so this sort of definitional equality satisfies the sort of conditions you'd expect of equality. So for example, we have this rule here, which says that um, if a context entails that we have a value of type capital A, then that value is definitionally equal to itself. Uh, this statement in orange here is basically just telling us that when we have that two things are equal, um, well, they both have to be of the same type, let's say they're of type capital A, then um, that entails that the first value is of type capital A. And we also have this idea of so-called symmetry, that if uh, A equals B, then B equals A. And notice that this can be used in conjunction with this to also get that this uh, B is of type capital A as well. Um, and we also have the kind of transitivity 
of equality. So if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So that's what this rule says. Um, and then we have a few more kind of rules um, which are sort of talking about equality of types as well. So this one's just saying that if little a is of type capital A and capital A is equal to capital B, then little a is of type capital B, which makes sense. And, and we can also sort of carry over the equality of two terms of type A um, to say that those two terms also equal in type capital B if um, type capital A is equal to capital B. So these are the sort of basic results about definitional equality. Now we also have propositional equality, which is a kind of more complicated thing involving the idea of identity types. And then the last thing I'll mention before I start getting on to talking about specific types is um, just the rules about universes. So we've already seen this uh, universe introduction rule here, which basically says that when we have a well-formed context, then we can always kind of produce this um, term UI, which is of type UI plus one. So this is sort of enabling us to talk about the level I type universe as a member of a level I plus one type universe. And then we also have this other rule here, which is basically saying that this kind of hierarchy of universes is cumulative. So in particular, it's saying that um, when gamma entails that capital A is of the ith level type universe, then gamma also entails that capital A is of the level I plus one type universe as well. So anything that's in the um, ith level universe is also in the ith plus one level universe. So these universes are kind of getting bigger and bigger as the index goes up. Okay, so now we really get into the meat of... <clears throat> okay, so now we really get into the meat of dependent type theory as we explain the rules for the specific types which we're mostly dealing with. So let's start with pi types. Now, um, you can see my sort of less formal video on... Now, you can see my previous video on dependent type theory to see about the kind of intuition behind pi types. I'm going to focus more upon the formal rules at the moment. Um, I mean, there's various other things I could say. Um, I mean, there's various other things to consider. Um, so I'm going to be laying out the kind of formal rules um, for dealing with pi types here. But um, you might like to consider um, for example, how these ideas relate to the sort of uh, pi functor, and there's also a sigma functor, which I discussed with respect to slice categories in the previous video. So you might want to be interested. So you might be interested in how these kind of formal rules relate with um, these ideas from category theory. On the other hand. You might be interested in um, how we can use these rules to derive the kind of rules of simple type theory. Um, so there's sort of um, several uh, issues you might be interested in. But um, I don't want to uh, be too divergent at the moment. I, I just want to um, exhibit all of the kind of rules for this dependent type theory at the moment. So let's start with the pi formation rule, okay? So um, gamma entails that we have capital A in our type universe. So basically we have a type capital A and gamma and X of type capital A entail that we have a type capital B. So this is basically saying that capital B is a type and the form of it might depend on this variable x of type a. So essentially this is saying that b is a type family here. And given this stuff, we have that gamma entails that we have this pi type here, which we write as um, pi of x and a of b, and that's a type. And, and roughly speaking, we can think of the members of this type as dependent functions, which send a value v of type a 
to a value of capital B of V. But um, really the specifics of what this type means are described by our rules, okay? Because at the end of the day, um, everything comes from these symbolic manipulation rules in a formal sense. Um, and so we have this pi introduction rule here. Um, and what this is basically saying is that if we have this context gamma, and in that context, when we have a variable X of type A, we have a term little b of type capital B, then we can basically re-express that as a function because we can get that gamma entails that lambda x of type a dot b is of this pi type okay so this is basically just saying that when we have a term little b that might have a variable x we can basically um convert that to a sort of dependent function so this is an introduction rule for our pi type it tells us how to sort of form values of this pi type, basically how to make these dependent functions. And then we also have this elimination rule um, for the pi type, which basically tells us how we can use uh, these values of our pi type. So basically if we have, if in our context gamma, we have a dependent function f um, and we have a value, little a, then um, we can, basically apply this function to this uh, input little a and that gives us f of little a and that's going to be of the type that we get if we take this type capital b and replace the variable x with a little a and this makes sense because it's basically just saying that if we apply this dependent function f to this input little a then we're going to have um then we're going to get a member of the sort of type which is indexed by that little a. So these are the sort of basic typing rules. And then we have some rules about equality, which really tell us how things work. So firstly, we have this sort of computation rule. So a computation rule basically gives us some sort of definitional equality. Um, which is basically telling us what happens when we apply one of these kind of elimination rules to the results of doing some introduction rules. And so in this case, what the rule is saying is that if in this context gamma, when we also have a variable X of type A, and when that entails that we have a term little b of type capital B, and when we also have an input little a of type capital A, well, in that case, if we sort of use our lambda to form this sort of function, which, um, well, in this case, if we sort of use our lambda to form this sort of function, lambda x dot b, and then we operate this on a, then the result is going to be what happened. Then the result that we get is going to be definitionally equal to the term little b with all of the free occurrences of x replaced with a. And this is basically our computation rule. It's um, really very similar to the one that we saw for the function types when we are considering simple type theory. And then we also have this uniqueness principle. So uniqueness principle basically gives us a definitional equality, which explains how the kind of elements of the type are uniquely determined by the result of doing the by the result of the elimination rules which are applied to it so in this case this uniqueness principle is basically telling us that um, say we have a value f of this pi type well then we can always write f as lambda x dot f of x and i should say here that um, when i write for example lambda x dot f of x that's really just shorthand for saying lambda x of type a dot f of x so basically sometimes i omit 
recording the type of the bound variable. OK, so basically, sometimes I omit recording the type of the bound variable just for brevity. So these are all the sort of main rules for the pi type. Um, we also have an extra sort of rule here. So all of this stuff I'm supposed to be writing above the horizontal line, but I ran out of space. But what this notation is basically meaning is that if we have this, this and this, then we have this. OK, so it's the normal kind of notation. It's just that um, we imagine all this stuff's written above the horizontal line. So what this condition is basically saying is that if we introduce values into our pi type using equal expressions, then we end up getting equal things being introduced. OK, um, so more precisely, it's saying that um, if we have a type capital A and a type family B and um, that might depend on a variable X of type A. And in such a case, we have that little b is equal to little b dash. Then the kind of dependent functions we form with those little b and little b dash are going to be definitionally equal. And so we could call this the equality for the pi introduction rule. And we're going to have a similar sort of um, rule about definitional equality for each of the types that we introduce. OK, I may not mention them all um, explicitly, but it's pretty obvious that when we're sort of creating values using definitionally equal things, then we want the resultant values to be equal as well. OK, um, so. So once again here, I'm using this kind of um, abbreviation here. So when I write lambda x dot b, it's really an abbreviation for this kind of thing. Also, when we use this kind of lambda notation, we imagine that instances of this variable x, which used to sort of freely occur in this term b, are now going to be kind of bound to this lambda operator. OK, so basically um, free variables can become bound to a lambda. And also, finally, since we've now introduced the rules for this pi type, which is basically this sort of type of dependent functions, we can now consider the ordinary function type is just really a kind of special case of this pi type. The special case where um, capital B here does not actually depend on this variable X of type A. Um, because in that case, where the sort of target set is independent of the value that we're operating on, uh, this pi type basically just corresponds to this ordinary type of uh, functions from A to B, which we saw in simple type theory. And we retain notation for independent type theory. OK, so the next big idea then is sigma types, also known as dependent pair types. And so essentially, uh, when we write this kind of notation, uh, sigma x in A of B, this is really denoting the type of pairs of a value V of A together with a value of capital B of V. OK, um, but of course, we're being more formal about things now. So um, firstly, we have a sigma formation rule, which is telling us how we can actually form these types. And it's basically saying that if we have a type capital A, and we have a type family B, which may depend on a variable X of type A, then it follows that we have this type, which is called sigma X in A of B. And we're denoting that that's a type because we're saying that that's a member of our i-th level type universe. And we can use this rule for any i. Now, um, this is basically how we form the type. But then, of course, we have a rule for uh, getting values in this type. So that's our sigma introduction rule. And this is basically just encapsulating the idea that the members of this sigma type are these dependent pairs. So what it's saying formally is that if we have a type family B, which may depend on a variable X of type A, and also if we have a term little a of type capital A, and we have a term little b of type 
capital B of A, essentially, because capital V may because capital B may have this variable X, but when we write capital B A slash X, we mean take capital B and replace all the free occurrences of this variable X with A. All right, so this is one of these particular um, types in this type family B, in particular the type index by little a. And we're saying that if we have a term little b in there, um, then that basically entails that little a comma little b will be a member of this uh, sigma type here, this type of dependent pairs. So essentially um, what this is really saying is that the, the values of this type are a pairs of a value of a and a value of the kind of um, type associated with that a. So this is basically telling us how we can get values in our sigma type. And then the other sort of thing we want to know is how can we use values of this sigma type? So for that, we want an elimination rule. And so the way I view this elimination rule is basically to see it as something similar to what we saw with the coproduct. You know, when we were considering, for example, the coproduct of, um, say, a pair of sets, D and E, if we had a function um, from D in to some set H and from E into some set H, then we could form this kind of piecewise function from d plus e to h, which kind of worked like the first function on the elements that came from d and worked like the second function on the elements that came from d. And basically it's a similar kind of scenario here, except we're not just adding together two kind of objects, we're adding together many objects and hence the sigma notation. But um, I'll be a bit more clear about what this uh, notation actually means and then I'll show you a picture and then hopefully it'll become clear. So the first thing we're basically saying is that we're essentially imagining that we have a kind of type family on our sigma type, okay? So we've formed our sigma type and then we have a variable of that sigma type and that's entailing that we have a type C, okay? So this is basically the way we can imagine it. Oh, I'll show you a picture. Um, so we sort of have uh, this type family B, which depends maybe on values from A. And then using that information, we can form this uh, sort of sigma type, sigma X in A of B. Um, we could call this the total space if we want. And then, we're really thinking of a type family kind of indexed by that total space. So for each of these values in this total space, we have a type. So for example, for a one comma one, we have C of a one comma one. Okay. Um, so that's basically what this first statement saying. The second statement is saying that given an X in A and a Y in B, we're supposing that we can get a G of type C of X comma Y. Okay, so what that's sort of basically saying is that we can think of G kind of like a function um, from these values uh, in these um, kind of types associated with our points of A, so for example, B of A1 and B of A2, and it's mapping those values into these kind of type families, which, and it's mapping these values into these kind of types associated with these points of a total space. Okay, so all of this is much simpler if we just consider for a start, the case where C is a sort of constant type, okay? And in that case, what we've really got is, and in that case where C is a constant type, all we really have is a function from B of A1 and a function from B of A2 and so on to this constant type. And we're sort of showing how those, how that function sort of translates 
uh, to a function um, into this constant type from the corresponding points in the total space. But, um, you know, more generally, we imagine that the sort of uh, target of G might be sort of shifting around according to this uh, type family C. OK, so this is the kind of formal way we say it. We say that um, given an X in A and a Y in B, um, we get G, which belongs to the type family, um, basically the type family associated with X comma Y. And then finally, we also have a value P in our total space. And given all that information, um, we have a point of C of P, basically. And we call this point end of sigma of C comma G comma P. Now we're recording here that Z is really now in this note. Now we're recording here that in this expression, uh, Z is sort of bound to C because this C here, this type may depend on Z and also that X and Y are kind of bound to G. Um, so this is kind of denoting bounding. It's a sort of um, fundamental notation appearing for the first time here. Um, if you want to understand it better, you can imagine that there are sort of lambdas here. Um, and then it maybe is easier to understand, but strictly speaking, that's not what's going on. This is a kind of primitive notation, which is just recording that these are now bound variables in in this term here. Um, anyway, this is basically telling us that um, when we have this kind of function here, this G, um, which is defined by sending these values um, to these kind of green types here, then there's this sort of corresponding function, which is called end of sigma, and it depends on Z and G, and it takes a P and sends it to C of P. And I've drawn this function here, this end thing. I haven't labeled it fully, but it's it's this, okay, uh, with P being the input. And you see it actually works um, sort of similar, and you see that this end function basically works in a similar way to how G works on the sort of corresponding elements of the total space. Um, and that's actually formalized by our computation rule for the sigma type, which, well, it's basically what it says is, is that, um, but more formally, we've got a similar setup to before. So we've got this uh, type C, which may depend on a point of the total space. We've got this G just like before. Um, we now have a value little a of type capital A and a value little b of type capital B of A, essentially. And uh, what this is saying is that if we evaluate this end function on the input A comma B, then the result is going to be what we get if we do G on A comma B. And so that's basically saying that this blue function kind of works like this orange function. So they're the main rules for our sigma type. Um, and this is a big deal because now we've defined our sigma type and our pi type. We've defined a lot of the stuff that we need. Um, now, if you look at the notation of the sigma type and pi type, I notice that the X of type A becomes bound in this type and similarly here. And also we have this kind of new notation. So when we write in of sigma of B, um, then we have this kind of new notation where we're basically recording that within this kind of term, Z is now bound to C and X and Y are bound to G. And also I should say, um, because now we've basically got product types as well, because when we do independent type theory, um, we just consider because when we're doing dependent type theory, we just consider the product type A times B to simply be an instance of this sort of sigma type when this uh, term capital B actually doesn't depend on X in A. And in such a case, sigma X in A of B 
um, can be thought of as basically meaning um, this product type, capital A times capital B. And so one can then go deeper into this theory and verify that the product type um, independent type theory basically works in a similar way and satisfies similar laws to the ones that it does within the uh, simple type theory, which we've already encountered before. Okay, so next up is some types or also known as coproduct types. And coproducts work in a similar sort of way to how they worked in simple type theory. But anyway, let's go through the formal rules. Firstly, if A is a type and B is a type, then A plus B is a type. That's the formation rule. We have a couple of introduction rules which correspond to the sort of left injection and right injection functions. So this first one is saying that if A is a type and B is a type and little a is a value of type capital A, then doing the left injection on little a will give us a value of type A plus B. And there's a similar one saying that we can do a right injection on B to get a value of A plus B. Um, now we get on to the elimination rule which really tells us how we can use values of this kind of coproduct type. And it's pretty similar to how it worked in the case of simple type theory. Um, but it's a little bit more involved because we basically want to talk about functions out of this coproduct type, but now they could be, but now these functions, um, their sort of target my, but now the sort of target type of these functions might depend on their values. So it's a little bit more complicated. So we suppose that we have some type family zeta parameterized by a Z of this coproduct type. Um, so we can sort of draw something like this, for example, we have a kind of coproduct type formed and then associated with each point of that is um, a sort of type um, zeta of z for every z in a plus b um, and then what we also have is we have a function c from a to so we also have a function c from x in a to zeta of left injection of x and we also have a function d from y and b to zeta of right injection of y so we sort of have um, things like this c and d defined here and given this stuff we can define this other kind of function from a plus b um, to the sort of values of our type family zeta uh, which kind of works in a similar way to how c works uh, on the values that came from a and how d works on the values that came from b so this is the kind of formal description of the typing for such a thing. Um, it's basically saying that if we have this type family zeta and we have these functions C and D and we have a value E of type A plus B, then we have this sort of function, which we call ind of A plus B. And that uh, takes our in our zeta and our C and our D. And these things have... Uh, these variables bound to them. So again, this notation means that Z is bound to Zeta in this expression and X is bound to C and Y is bound to D. And the real input here is E. That's the value of type A plus B. And this induction function, whatever we want to call it, operates um, and gives us a value back in Zeta of Z. OK, and I've drawn how it works. And we can verify how it works momentarily by looking at the computation rules. Um, and we, we call this kind of thing induction. Um, we called it something similar um, for the sigma type up here. In fact, this is really working in a kind of similar way to the way that this kind of thing works for coproducts, except here we're just adding together two types as opposed to many. Um, the term induction, it's a bit peculiar to use in this context, uh, but we'll see that there's a similar sort of, um, notion defined when we get on to 
natural number types. And in that context, uh, this sort of phrase induction kind of makes more sense. Um, anyway, how exactly this int a plus b function works is sort of fixed by the next rules. So this is the computation rule for our sum type or the first computation rule. There are actually two. Um, and it's basically the same setup as before. But here we're just saying that if we have a value little a of type capital A and we do this induction function on the left injection of little a, then that basically gives an output of C of A. So it's basically saying that this induction function, which we just defined, um, if we're operating on values which came from type capital A via a left injection function, then the way that this induction thing works on those values is basically corresponding to the way C works. And then the second computation rule says that a similar story is true for the stuff that came from type B. And that's this rule here. Okay, so you can pause the video and check um, that basically this is um, just saying that this induction function we're making up works on the elements that came from B in a similar way to how D works. And if you compare this stuff with the um, ideas I introduced for the simple type theory, you'll see that basically this in function is working the same way as the kind of match function there. Speaking of which, um, there when we did simple type theory, there was a sort of uniqueness principle as well for uh, some types or co-product types, I could say. Um, and you might notice that that's missing in this uh, scenario. And also, um, since we're talking about that, the um, sort of uniqueness principle was also missing when we were talking about uh, sigma types before. So where is it? Why isn't it here? Well, basically, um, the kind of equality that we get for, well, basically, there are uniqueness principles for sigma types and coproduct types in this dependent type theory, but they're not involving definitional equality. They are involving propositional equality. In other words, we're not assuming uniqueness principles. Um, we prove them um, and we prove them by talking about identity types. So I'm not mentioning those principles because they're not actually sort of axioms of the theory. They're um, there because they're not actually uh, part, they're not actually axioms of the theory. They are things that we can prove. Okay. And uh, I urge you to have a look at the homotopy type theory book, uh, chapters one and two, um, to see the full details of this kind of thing. Okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the empty type. Now, this is defined in a sort of similar way to how it was defined in simple type theory. Firstly, we have a formation rule for the empty type which basically says that we can consider this empty type zero to be a member of the type universe UI for any I. And then the other thing we have is this elimination rule for the empty type. We don't have an introduction rule because there's no values of the empty type, but we do have this elimination rule. Um, and what it basically says is that if Zeta is a type, which depends on a variable X of the empty type, and we have a value A of the empty type, then we have a value of zeta of A, and that's called ind zero of zeta comma A. And notice this X is bound to this zeta here. So the way I like to think of this is in terms of logic. So um, let's assume that there are no unicorns. Right. So um, I just want to illustrate this idea. So if we assume there's no unicorns, then the set of unicorns is the empty set. Um, or if you like, we can think of zero as the set of unicorns. And now this sort of thing we can think of as a function from zero to types. Or if we want to do uh, propositions as types, we can think that this is a sort of predicate on unicorns. So basically, maybe this is like, maybe zeta of x is like the statement that unicorn x can fly. 
okay um and so it's sending every unicorn x of type zero to this uh type zeta of x and we'll assume that zeta of x is a type which has elements if and only if unicorn x can fly so zeta of x is the uh, type of uh, evidence that unicorn x can fly and um Also, we suppose we have this unicorn A. And what this is then saying is that we then have evidence that unicorn A can fly. Okay. So basically, if you're talking about a non existent thing, you can prove it does anything. This is the kind of idea, um, which is a bit weird, but it sort of makes sense. Um, okay. So that's the empty type. Uh, we also have the unit type, which we can think of as a singleton set. So we have this formation rule saying that we have a unit type and we have this introduction rule that says that we can always produce this element star of the unit type. So this means element star of the unit type, which we denote as one. And we also have this elimination rule for the unit type. And what this is saying is that if we have a type family Zeta, which is dependent on X of type one, and if we have a value C in Zeta of star, and we have a value A of type one, then we have a value of zeta of A. So basically what these rules are saying here for our unit type is, firstly, um, we're saying that if we pick some value C of zeta of star, then we can always sort of define this function uh, end of one, which we can basically think of as a function which sends a value A of type one to a value of zeta of A. So that would be the type family associated with the value A of type one. And then um, notice that this end function here is set up using this value C of type zeta of star. And um, then we have this computation rule, which tells us more about this kind of function. It tells us that when we operate this function on star, um, when star is the input, then C will always be the output. And that will be a member of zeta of star. OK, so basically what this um, elimination rule is saying is that if we have this type family zeta indexed by X of type one, and we have this value C of type zeta star, then we can form this function here, um, which is going to send a value A of type one to zeta of A. And then the computation rule says that such a function works on star of type one by sending that to this value C of type zeta of star this value C, which we kind of use to set up this end function, okay? And there's also a sort of uniqueness statement as well, but that's a propositional statement. That's something that we prove. So that's not one of our sort of axioms, one of these rules that we write in red. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about um, is natural number types. Now, um, I should have written these rules for the natural number type in red uh, because they are sort of axioms of this dependent type theory. And I accidentally wrote them in black instead. Um, however, um, I can kind of pretend that I did this mistake on purpose in a way, because I must say it is my opinion um, and it's not a very popular opinion, but it's my opinion that um, the natural numbers and all of these kind of infinite sets in mathematics 
have something a little bit less um, sort of exact or logical or comprehensible about them because they're basically infinite structures. Now, of course, natural number objects or types corresponding to them can be defined in mathematics. I'm not disputing that. But I think the fact that um, we're basically talking about mathematical objects which have structures which go on and on forever, which essentially cannot be represented in our universe as far as we know, um, I think that means something. And I think that means, in a sense, that... Um, and I think that means, in a sense, that we're talking about something maybe less fundamental than the rest of the kind of machinery of type theory. And I think if you look at the structure of category theory, you can kind of see evidence for that. I mean, um, look at the way that things like products, co-products, initial objects, terminal objects, exponential objects, and to a lesser degree, the kind of functors corresponding to sigma and pi types, um, and the equalizers, the identity types, look at the way all that stuff is so interwoven into the theory, how it all comes together in a package. Um, and then in every case, when you're dealing with these categories, it's like you have to kind of introduce these natural number objects as kind of like added extras. And in my opinion, uh, that suggests that this idea is not as fundamental as the rest of the things. Um, indeed, you can consider these categories of finite sets, and they also have a lot of nice structure. And so um, I sort of believe, since you know I'm supposed to be talking about modern mathematics, my guess would be um, if you fast forward mathematics about 500 years, I don't think you know, if, um, you know, it continues to get better and so on. I don't think natural numbers as a completed kind of collection, um, I don't think that concept's going to be held in quite as high regard as it is at the moment. Um, I mean, let's face it, you can have a theory like the kind of simple type theory that I discussed before, and you can have the notion that you can kind of keep co-producting unit types together indefinitely to make a finite set as large as you want. And I like that idea. Um, but the idea that you just have some um, infinite kind of structure, I think that once you start talking about that, you um, are sort of losing a degree of clarity. Um, now that is very debatable. Um, and I'm not like heavily subscribed to this idea. I like number theory as much as the next guy. Um, however, I do think it's uh, worth bearing in mind the difference between kind of structures that we can um, that we can get our minds around and ones that we can't. Now, this might seem a little bit um, of a kind of paradoxical view to have for somebody who likes concepts like um, the category of categories or the uh, category of sets or whatever. But the point is that those things um, sort of, I think of them at least as categorical concepts, which I like to use them as intuitive ideas, um, which are maybe inherently a bit fuzzy. But when it comes to talking about formal type theory, I must admit a slight amount of um, trepidation in introducing natural number types, especially when you see that they don't fit quite as well with, for example, this general theory of correspondence with slice categories. Um, they don't fit quite as well as um, having independent type theory, which doesn't come with a built-in natural number type, I think. So basically, in a nutshell, I think that considering type theories which don't have natural number types built in is something worth doing. Um, but anyway, still, um, natural number types are great. And if we want to do mathematics easily and practically, we want to include them. So here are the rules. Uh, if we have a context gamma, then we can have this natural number type that we call N. Um, also, we always have this um, term zero of a natural number type. So zero is a natural number. 
Also, if we have n is a natural number, then the successor of n is a natural number. These are our introduction rules. And then our elimination rule, we can kind of illustrate it like this, okay? Um, so basically, um, imagine associating each natural number uh, n with a type zeta of n. That's um, what this sort of first... So firstly, imagine associating each natural number x with a type zeta of x. Um, that's what we have here. And then if we also have a point of zeta of zero, if we have uh, a time x, which is a natural number, and we have a state y in zeta of x, then c of s of x comma y is going to be the state of our system at the next time step. Okay, so basically what we're saying in sort of rough notation is that c of x of x comma y um, is going to be the kind of member of um, zeta of x plus one, um, which is what happened, which is what we get when we update um, this state y in zeta of x okay so essentially what this means is that we can think of um, c of s x comma blank as the sort of update function associated with the x time step of a kind of dynamical system um, with a sort of variable update um, mechanism so i think it's easiest to see this with a picture basically um, anyway, we have this, I'll just finish off describing this formally, then I'll try and talk about what's really going on. We have this and we also have a natural number n. And in this case, and so what we have form, so I'll just finish talking about this formally, then I'll try and explain the idea. Um, so given all this stuff, we basically have a way to map a natural number n to a state of zeta n. And so really what this is telling us is, how to iterate a kind of time dependent dynamical system. Okay, so um, we have this way of associating types with every natural number um, and associated with a set zeta of zero, we pick a point C naught and then for every sort of time step X, we have this uh, function C of S of X comma blank, which is a function from zeta of x to zeta of x plus one and so that lets us update the function uh, and so that lets us update our state so if we keep applying um, these kind of update functions then c naught gets updated to be a point in zeta one and then zeta two and so on and that gives us a sequence of uh, values a value in zeta one and then a, val a value in zeta zero and then a value in zeta one and a value in zeta two and so on and that's what's sort of tracked by this uh, so-called induction and that's what's tracked by this so-called induction um, value end of n this is the kind of function from n to the zeta values now uh, the fact now the now the um, now the fact that this kind of function here is called ind for induction um, does actually make sense uh, because this really is like induction. Okay, so if we think about propositions as types, um, this kind of type family zeta here is essentially, um, we can think of it as associating every natural number with a proposition, okay, which is true if and only if zeta of x is non-empty. And so what this is then saying is that if we have a proof C naught of zeta of zero, um, then, and so what this is saying is that if we have a proof a C naught of zeta of zero, and also we have a way of showing that a proof of zeta of X gives us a proof of zeta of X plus one, then by induction over the natural numbers, we can prove zeta of n for every natural number n. And these kind of ideas are sort of formal. And then 
And so this is a nice kind of way of thinking about this and a nice way of thinking about kind of inductive proofs, okay? Um, but also the sort of dynamical system, the, the time-dependent dynamical systems kind of view of this is or can be sort of understood in terms of thinking about these computation rules for natural number types. So this first rule here basically says that this induction function that we make um, it at time zero, it gives us back the starting point C zero. And the second part of the computation rule says that, and the second part of our computation rule says that at time N, the value that this induction function um, sends the successor of n to is going to be basically the result of doing the update function on the value that it sends um, n to. Okay, I, I just have to make a slight correction here. Um, this ought to be, this one is replacing y and it's the n that's replacing x, okay? So in here, it's the, um, so here we're saying that um, this updated thing here is the result of doing this update function on the old state. Okay, so the final type that we have to talk about is the identity type. So in a sense, this is maybe one of the most interesting ones. Um, now, if we have a type capital A and we have values little a and little b of type capital A, then we can form this type A equals B. And this is the identity type. And loosely speaking, we can think of the values of this type as paths from A to B or evidence that A and B are equal. Okay, so we have an introduction rule for this equality type, which allows us to grab values of the equality type. And it's a um, sort of simple little rule. It basically says that if we have a type capital A and we have a value little a of that type, then we can get a value refl of little a. Which is, which is of the type little a equals little a, belongs to the identity type associated with a comma a. Um, and you can think of this as a trivial path um, from a to itself, or a, a trivial proof that a is equal to itself. And this is the idea. Now, the other main idea to do with um, identity types is this idea of so-called path induction. Now, I mentioned this briefly in my sort of informal video about dependent type theory, and I talked about a principle which is called the principle of based path induction. And now there's an equivalent principle, which is simply called the principle of path induction, which is a little bit more complicated, but um, it's equivalent to the other one. And it's that second uh, principle, which is, um, encoded formally in um, in the theory of uh, in in this formal theory. So here's the principle laid out. Um, now the first thing is that basically for any x and y of type A and for a path P from x to y, there's a type zeta associated with that. So essentially, imagine our type A and we have all these values, which you can think of as points for the time being. So they are values of type A, and then we have these paths uh, between them, which are inhabitants of these different identity types. And then we're going to associate each such path with a type. So I'll just draw a kind of bag of points associated with each path. And we could do this in any way that we want. Now, the second thing is that for each point Z of A, we produce a value um, C of Z, which is a member of zeta of Z, Z, comma, refl Z. So essentially what this means is that we pick out a value 
uh, in the kind of type that we've associated with each reflexive path. So this here would be C of X. We'd also be picking out a value of C of Y. And here's a value of uh, C of K. So this is a value associated with the type associated with the reflexive path of point K. All right. Um, so that's the second thing. So now we've done this and we've done this. And then the next thing is we take a value A and a value B and a path P dash from A to B. So maybe this is our A and this is our B and this is our P dash, for example. And what this result tells us is that we can then produce a value of that type, basically. Then that, what this result basically tells us is that we can produce a value of that type. And that's what we're calling the result of doing this end equal thing on P dash. Okay. So notice that this is a value of the type associated with uh, zeta of A comma B comma P dash. Um, and there's more to this principle of path induction because we can also say something about the way that this principle of path induction works. So we can also, we also have, so the other thing is that we also have a principle of computation for this identity type. And this tells us a little bit more about how this sort of picking out of values um, of the types associated with our paths works. And in particular, this induction thing, um, the value it will ascribe to, the value that this will ascribe to um, the path associated with REFL A for any particular A is actually going to be equal to, to the kind of C value ascribed with that, okay? So basically what we're saying here is that this thing C of Y is gonna be equal to the thing that end um, maps REFL of Y to. Okay, so this is the basic idea. Now, um, how are we to make sense of this? Well, in a sense, what this is really saying is that, I mean, so how are we to make sense of this? Well, um, one way is to think about propositions as types, okay? So basically, um, what this is saying is that if you're going to, you have all these paths between these points, okay? And these are the sort of values of this identity type. And if you have um, one of these paths, say P from X to Y, then that's going to be, in a sense, a sort of evidence that X and Y are similar in some way. So imagine then that you ascribe each path between each pair of points in your space with um, some kind of a proposition, okay? Um, now, the thing is that, in a sense, these similar things ought to be similar in similar ways, if that makes sense. Um, and there ought to be a sort of indiscernibility of identicals or something of this uh, of this sense. So if we then associate these different pairs um, of equal things with propositions, so basically we associate each path with a proposition, then if this proposition holds true for the trivial paths, um, as in um, these kind of reflexive paths from Z to Z, then it ought to hold true for all the other paths. And there ought to be a sort of way to extend that evidence for the trivial paths to the other paths. And when I say extend, I mean in such a way that um, the evidence still agrees. Uh, I mean, and when I say extend, I mean that um, the way we're assigning, the way we're picking out values of all of these other paths um, with this end function agrees with this kind of evidence we have, um, you know, C of A, basically. So yeah, this is um, the idea of identity types in a nutshell. I'm probably covering this too quickly. And so I urge you to have a careful look through the coverage of a concept in a homotopy type theory book if um, you want more detail on this. 
Okay, so I said that. Okay, so I said that I'd cover homotopy type theory, but I didn't say that I was going to cover it very thoroughly. Um, the fact of the matter is, it's a sort of new subject, and it's a very deep subject. And uh, if I really wanted to go into how to explain it all in a sort of proper way, I think it would be, you know, maybe taking five or ten hours or something. Um, so what I thought I'd do, since I've now introduced all of the formal type theory rules, is go through a sort of um, lightning fast uh, definition of basically homotopy type theory. Now, this is probably not going to be the clearest um, mathematics um, teaching I've ever recorded. Um, and there's certainly a lot of things which need and there's certainly a lot of things which um, one will want to look into more to sort of understand what's going on here. But um, nevertheless, basically, uh, sort of basic homotopy type theory you can think of as the kind of theory that we have when we consider um, this dependent type theory, this intentional Martin Loft theory that I've just um, explained. And then we add to it a couple of kind of axioms. Um, so I'm going to explain this now. So um, suppose we have a type family P. Um, so that's an association of each value of A with a type. And then let's consider dependent functions F and G. So um, these are of this kind of pi type here. Now a homotopy from F to G, we define that as a dependent function of this type here. Um, so it's pi of x in A of f of x equals g of x. So logically, we can think of this as a proof that f of x is equal to g of x. Now, this is just um, double bar here, this equals. So um, this is an identity type here. So in particular, this is an identity type for these two values. So in particular, this is an identity type for these two values of uh, P of X here. And a way that we can think of a homotopy is it's something like um, a kind of analog of a natural transformation. Um, or, I mean, think about, for example, um, functions in set theory, in ordinary set theory. When do we say they're equal? We say they're equal when they're equal on all the inputs. And what this is basically is a kind of bundle of proofs for every input that um, doing F on that input is equal to G on that input. So, um, yeah, we can think of a homotopy as almost kind of like going towards showing that F and G are equal, um, but it's not exactly the same thing. OK, so basically for a function F from A to B, we have this type of, we can think of it as a type of proofs that F is what we might call an equivalence. And it's given by this expression here. So basically the things of this type um, consist of a function G from B to A, which has the property that um, F after G is homotopic to the identity arrow of B and also an arrow H from B to A, which has the property that H after F is homotopic to the identity arrow of A. And here we can just define composition like normal. So F after G of X is uh, F of G of X. Um, and so really um, saying that, and so really saying that F is an equivalence really means kind of producing something like a section and a retraction of F. And then we can write a equivalence and, and then we can write the type of equivalences from A to B like this. And um, this consists of the dependent pairs of a function F from A to B together with evidence that it is an equivalence. Um, so now with this idea, we can state the kind of axioms 
So now with this idea, we can state the kind of axioms of homotopy type theory. So suppose So suppose that we have two functions, f and g, suppose that these are dependent functions, so they belong to this pi type here, where of course um, b is a type family. Well, in that case, well, in that case, there's this function h apply, which um, takes a member of this identity type f equals g uh, to a member of this type of uh, pi of x in a of f of x is equal to g of x. So this is a sort of uh, pi type built using these identity types. Um, and so h apply is a kind of function from, we could say it's from the sort of space of paths from f to g to this kind of space of um, kind of proofs that f and g are pointwise equal, okay? Because an element of this type here, if we're sort of reading it um, as a sort of logical thing, we're saying that an element of here, we're saying that we can think that an element of this type here is really a sort of proof that um, f of x is propositionally equal to g of x for all x in A. And if you think about like functions in set theory, we'd really define f and g to be equal if this kind of condition is met. And so we'd imagine that this kind of type of proofs that f is propositionally equal to g, and this kind of type of proofs that f and g are pointwise equal, we'd imagine that these two types might be kind of similar. And that's really what, um, this um, axiom of functional extensionality says because it really says that this type of uh, paths from f to g is is equivalent to this kind of type here um, this kind of pi type so more precisely though uh, we actually have this function h apply from this type of paths from f to g to this type here and we can think of this h apply as being defined using our principle of path induction. Uh, so imagine for each path p from any function f to a function g, um, like, like this, um, we associate such a path p with this particular type. Okay, so that's our type allocation. And then if we consider the kind of trivial path where the kind of path refl f from uh, f to f, and then if we consider the kind of trivial path, the kind of path refl f from f to f, um, for that kind of path, we can, of course, find something of this sort of corresponding type. And that would just be this sort of dependent function, which um, maps each x in a to refl of f of x. And so we can find an occupant and so we can find an occupant of this sort of type in the case where we have a refl and f and g are the same. And therefore we can use the principle of path induction to find an element of this type for each path p from any f to any g. And that's what defines this uh, h apply function. And then the principle of uh, functional extensionality basically says that this h apply function is a equivalence and in particular um, there's this kind of proof um, which involves this kind of um, function called fun x which goes in the opposite direction so it goes from this type to this type and um, that together with these homotopies here um, which we're proposing exist constitute a kind of proof that uh, this h apply thing here really is an equivalence and therefore um, with this kind of axiom of functional extensionality 
uh, we can write that this type here is equivalent to this type here. And so this is usually the uh, way functional extensionality is said, but I've said it in a bit more detail. Um, so that's one of the axioms which make us have so that's one of the axioms which sort of give us this homotopy type theory. The other one is this so-called univalence axiom. So um, consider types A and B. Well, there's this identity type, because these are both members of our universe, U. So there's this identity type, uh, A equals B. And... Um, the elements of this type, we can think of them as paths from A to B. And there's a function um, from this type of paths to the type of equivalences from A to B. Um, and how can we see this? Well, and how can we see this? Well, again, we can use path induction, okay? So imagine for every path P from A to B in this universe, um, we ascribe that, we associate that kind of path with this type of equivalences from A to B. Well, if we do that, then for the kind of trivial case where we have uh, this path REFL of A, of this type A equals A, well, for such a path, we can certainly produce a value um, of this type of equivalences from a to a um, and that associated and that kind of equivalence associated with that reflexive path that trivial path um, the kind of corresponding um, equivalence will just be the sort of trivial equivalence where um, the function we use is the identity function the kind of functions going in the, in the opposite direction are also identity functions and the kind of homotopies involved in that proof are the identity functions as well so everything's just identities um so we can we can find an element of this kind of set when a equals b and we're using refl and therefore so we can find an element of this type when a equals b and we're using refl and therefore so we can find an element of this type when a is precisely the same as b and we're using the refl path and therefore the principle of path-based induction allows us to find an element of this type for any path P from any capital A to any capital B. And that's what defines this function called ID to equiv. And then the univalence axiom actually says that this ID to equiv function is itself an equivalence. And as such, there's a function going in the opposite direction called UA or univalence axiom. And um, there's a sort of full proof that that thing is an equivalence so we have these kind of homotopies involved as well um, and so the univalence axiom is sometimes uh, written like this um, that you know the type of the the type of sort of evidence that a is equal to b is equivalent to the equivalences from a to b okay and it basically encapsulates this idea that when we're doing homotopy type theory, we can think of things which are equivalent or isomorphic as sort of being equal, as long as we keep track of the ways in which they're equivalent. And if you are looking at something like category theory um, and you want to think about things like the idea of, well, I mean, category theory is pretty easy to sort of uh, represent in this sort of theory because... Um, you know, we, we've seen already in the informal coverage of dependent type theory how easy it was to um, describe things like the type of semigroups and describing the type of categories is not much harder. And then we can have the idea of like equivalences between categories and we can, using things like this univalence axiom, we can match that up with ideas of equalities of and using things like this univalence axiom, we can relate those kind of ideas of, you know, equivalent categories and isomorphic categories and equal categories and paths between categories. And there's also a, a lot more um, to homotopy type theory 
especially describing the ideas of paths, which we can think of as proofs. And there's also the notion of paths between paths. So if we have these paths P and Q from A to B, we can think that P and Q are members of this identity type A equals B, which we might write as a, we might put a subscript there to remember that we're working in a type capital A, but we don't always have to use that subscript. But the thing is that we can then go further and then we can consider something like a path alpha between paths. And that's like a sort of homotopy, like a continuous deformation of one path into another. Okay, so I thought a nice way to finish off this series and to sort of establish more of a connection between maths and computing would be to talk about a specific computer programming language uh, where one can implement a lot of this type theory. And I decided to talk about Idris because for one thing, there's a project involving doing category theory in Idris, which I think really helps connect even more things together. So I should say off the bat that I'm not an expert in Idris. I'm, well, you can see that I'm not an expert in Idris um, because I wanted to make a video to show how to install Idris, um, which I've done and I've put links to that video in the description. Um, but if you look at those, you'll see that there's quite a lot of fumbling around as I try and install and set this thing up on my machine, um, which I've been able to do. So you can check those videos out if you're very patient to follow the steps to get um, Idris working on your machine as well. Or you can simply follow the instructions um, that you'll find by Googling it, which is probably a better thing to do. Anyway, once you've got Idris installed and you've got it running in VS Code, you can follow along with what I'm doing. But I'm really just going to give a very, very brief introduction to Idris and then talk about this particular code. So Idris is a programming language based on dependent type theory. It has syntax quite similar to that of Haskell. Um, so I've written some code here and I've gone to the proper directory and let's run it. So we do Idris and then the file name .idr is the extension. And so I've run this and now I can run these different commands. So here, for example, I made this function, which takes in an integer and outputs an integer. And this is the definition of a function. So this here basically means lambda x dot. So if we do this function, square it on five, I mean, if we do this function square space it on five, we get 25. The identity type can also be gotten by using an equal sign. And we can think about this kind of duality um, of propositions as types. So. For example, here we're saying that my theorem is something of the type nine is equal to square root of three. So in other words, my theorem is a member of the type. So in other words, my theorem is a member of the identity type nine equals nine. And if we set my theorem to be this reflexive kind of element, then that is indeed an element of the appropriate type. Here's how we can set up products in Idris. So I'm calling the product and to make this connection with
So I'm calling the product and to make this connection with logic more kind of pronounced. And you see the way that we can describe it. We say that and is of this function type that it takes in a type and another type and returns a type. So, I mean, it's basically product. We're saying that a product is something that sort of takes two objects and returns an object. And we have this introduction rule here, which takes two inputs, an input of type A and an input of type B, and gives us an output of type and a b and then here's code for the projections and you see that they're defined using pattern matching so here's an example that i coded my ball and that and you see it's stored as and intro true space seven and so if we do this first projection my bool and that then it gives us true back okay because I've coded all that here so if you know about Haskell then this should make a lot of sense if you don't know about Haskell I highly recommend um, the course material you'll find on Bartos Milowski's channel uh, both his introduction to Haskell and his category theory for programmers both fantastic and sort of one of the great things about idris is that it goes beyond haskell in the sense that haskell's more sort of akin to the simple type theory whereas idris really has dependent type theory so we can talk about pi types and sigma types and all of these more kind of fancy things so here's a way we can talk about the identity functions in idris and so we can say that this identity function it takes in a type t and then it gives us a function from t to t and that function is the identity function so if we do id of t then that results in this identity function lambda x dot x essentially um, and so we can see here is like what this identity function would look like in type theory at the bottom here and so uh, you can see that we can essentially encode pi types using this idris syntax and we can also do sigma types or dependent pairs if you like uh, using this double star syntax here so basically what i've got here is something which is it's what a mathematician might call a magma it's essentially a set with a binary operation and that's we're saying that bin op is of that type and my particular binary operation it involves the type of natural numbers and its addition okay so what we're really doing here is what i've shown at the top um we're making this sort of particular magma or set with binary operation and it's the one involving the natural numbers which is addition and you can do the usual things with recursion for example here i'm uh, implementing the fibonacci numbers 
So, okay, that is like a five minute introduction to Idris. Now I want to talk about the implementation of category theory in this. So there's a very interesting organization called Statebox. I'm not a member of Statebox or anything, but um, I do find their work very interesting. And one of the things that they've done is to make a library of code for Idris to do category theory in. And I've been trying to understand this. And so I sort of copied some of their code and tried to document it for myself. I always think that's a good thing to do. And so I've written uh, this document. I'll put a link in the description to the repository where you can find my um, sort of documentation and code, which is based on the state box stuff. And so the idea is to try and understand um, the basic idea of how these uh, people in the state box project were able to encode category theory in Idris. Why do I think this is good? Well, I mean, when you start doing a lot of category theory, it can get really quite abstract. And I think it can get to a point where one starts to worry about whether other people can understand it, whether it's correct, whether you'll be able to understand it when you return to it in a few months, etc. And I think for all these reasons, it's great to be able to actually encode what one's doing digitally. And this sort of category theory in Idris kind of library that these uh, people at Statebox have come up with, I think is great for that. So I wanted to just very briefly explain how category theory can be done in Idris. So I've got the code here, but this is really just, as I say, copied straight off the state box site. And the first thing we do is use this record command, and then we're basically defining what a category is. So basically this way of describing a category in Idris seems to correspond to this sort of more traditional way of talking about a category, which we do using dependent type theory. Okay, so essentially what we're saying here is that a category consists of a type OBJ, which is this sort of type of object. So we can think of this as like corresponding to a set of objects. And then for every pair of objects, we have this type uh, more AB, which is the type of morphisms or arrows from a to b so think of it kind of like a home set and then we also for any object a we have an identity arrow which is a member of this type of um, arrows from a to a and we also have a composition function defined so what we're saying is that for all objects A, B, and C, and for all arrows F from A to B and G from B to C, we have a member of the collection of arrows from A to C, and that's the composition of F before G. And we also have this left identity thing. And what this is basically doing is it's proving that um, our identity arrows are indeed left identities. Okay, so in particular, it's basically a proof um, that for any pair of objects A and B and for any arrow F from A to B, if we compose the identity function of A before F, then we get F. 
and the way that we get that as a proof is that we use these identity types so you see that we have this kind of Idris code here which is basically saying that given this stuff given the objects and the arrows um, we can sort of map those to this identity type which is you know finding an inhabitant of this type is basically proving what we want and similarly there's a way of representing the right identity and associativity so this kind of structure is basically a collection of objects arrows between objects identity arrows and a specification of composition together with proofs that the identity arrows and associativity work as we want them to and i really think it's a beautiful thing actually um, that we can take all of these ideas and encode them so succinctly i mean this might seem like a complicated definition for a basic data structure but then again you know the definition of categories is quite complicated and i've seen um, some maths books which take a lot longer to explain what a category is than than this small snippet of code which is utterly precise so it's quite remarkable really anyway um so that's basically how we can encode categories and then the other thing i wanted to do was actually implement a sort of example of a category and i thought i'd go for a discrete category so remember for a particular sort of set of objects the discrete category using those objects is just the category that only has those objects and it has no arrows except identity arrows <coughs> so basically what we want to do is we want to have a kind of function which takes a type a and it returns the discrete category that has elements of that type as objects so basically to do this we just need to make all of these bits and pieces that go into a category because essentially we can think of a category as a sort of dependent seven tuple um, where we have these elements from these different things in the sigmas um, you know the data and the proofs and so on and so we just need to make those different pieces and then we can use this make category kind of constructor to do what we want so in idris the code is like this so firstly we want to have some objects we want to have a type of object so we'll just specify a type as an input i mean we really want to define this kind of function here which takes in a type a and then using that type a and a load of other stuff that we'll define it makes a discrete category um, on objects of that type so in order to do this we need to specify how the arrows and identity arrows and composition etc are made and so for example the arrows are made by this discrete morphism function here and basically what this says is that for a couple of objects x and y the type of discrete morphisms from x to y is this identity type x equals y now it's interesting in idris um, this identity type x equals y if x is the same as y then there's just a single inhabitant of this which is called refl otherwise there's no inhabitants of this type x equals y if x and y are actually different so this is a bit different to what we find in more general type theories or in homotopy type theory where there can be 
many inhabitants of x equals y. In this case in Idris, the way that the type theory is implemented, the identity type is either empty or it just has a single inhabitant, I believe. Um, but like I say, I'm not really an expert in Idris. But anyway, so that means that we can use identity types to define these discrete morphisms because this naturally gives us a nice sort of type um, which is empty when x is different from y and just as a single element when x is equal to y and that's exactly the nature of the home set of arrows from x to y in this sort of discrete category that we're wanting to set up and then we can set up our identity arrows so basically each object x is associated with this refl arrow which is an arrow from x to x and in a similar way we can set well in a in a sort of um way using similar ideas at least we can set up composition and identity arrows and proof so proof associativity and then we can just wrap all this stuff um with a make category and this will give us our function which sends a type a to the discrete category on objects on and using all these commands we can basically <coughs> and using all these commands we can basically make this sort of function discrete category which sends a type a to the discrete category which has objects as elements of that type A. And here's an example of this working. So I set my type to be this kind of Boolean like thing, which has two elements, true and false. And so I use this command to make a discrete category on that. And then I wanted to talk about this object true and the arrows from that to itself. And here I'm referring to a particular one. So let's see this running. Essentially corresponds to this reflexive element of this identity type. My true equals my true. And what's my true? Let's find out. It's a member of the type my bool. And my bool is basically the type of objects through which we built this uh, category here. So there we go. I mean, this is just a few minute introduction. Like I say, you can check out my code. Um, but if you're very interested in this stuff, I recommend more that one sort of goes to Statebox and follows the tutorials and sets up that repository properly and so on.